Well, welcome again to another evening of the Open Classroom, Policy Advice to the Governor. Um, Barry is in Israel with a city-to-city -city delegation. He's in Haifa, at Valera in Haifa, looking at innovation districts. I think that this, is, this is true. I kid you not, they're looking at uh, discussing innovation districts in Israel. And we, we really know someone's really a policy one when they go halfway around the world to look at innovation districts. So <laughs> I think the mayor's in Italy. Um, doing culture. Innovation. Innovation, Innovation districts. Yeah, <laughs> sure he is. Um, and I'm on, I'm on film, so yes, Mr. Mayor, you're right. I, 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 yes. um, tonight's topic is one that's dear to my heart. Well, let me, before, before I do that, I'm sorry, if I remember my order. Of, um, remember, we don't have class next week. It is the night for Thanksgiving. Uh, so I'd like to make sure you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We'll be back here on December 1st to talk about transportation. Um, so remember, no, no class next week. Um, tonight's topic is one that is dear to my heart because I, I teach environmental policy is one of the areas of my own focus, and I have published in environmental policy over the years. And, and most of my area is on sort of regulatory policy, so it's not in the areas of the same areas as our guest tonight. But it's an area that I, I think about on occasion in terms of the broad sweeps of environmentalism in the United States over the last 30, 50, 100 years. I mean, my, my scope has gone back to the late 19th century. And the topic tonight excites me because it is a focus on an inter intertwined topic of energy and environment. And we pair those two together because you cannot talk about the environment without talking about energy and vice versa. So much of, of, of contemporary history, the history of the industrial age, is, in fact, this intertwining of energy, how we get energy, how we use energy, the side effects of energy, and impacts on the environment. So the two are in inextricably intertwined. Whether you go back to the late 19th century when the Sierra Club fought against the Hetch Hetchy Dam in California to prevent it from being flooded for a, power, uh, for a hydropower project for San Francisco. They lost that project, but it became a defining moment for the Sierra Club. To the 1950s and 60s, when the eras of the, the modern environmental era starts, in the 60s in particular, with the Sierra Club, again, fighting against the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, Glen Canyon Dam, or with the other environmental groups fighting, fighting against the uh, hydropower project along the, the Hudson River, um, or in fact, the entire uh, you know, effort against nuclear power or the entire way that energy framed environmentalism with the Santa Barbara oil spill 40 years ago. Sound familiar? We had, we had, we had the, the, the deep water horizon this last summer. So you cannot talk about energy and environment as separate entities. They are intertwined. Um, and indeed, the themes we talk about today, sustainability, global warming, climate change, however one, one wants to frame it, alternative energy, energy independence. These are all terms that connect together on this, this <coughs> difficult and exciting area of energy and environment. And it's exciting because, in fact, in, in technological terms, we may be on the brink of exciting new technologies that will enable us to produce energy from non-traditional sources, <coughs> or from old sources, solar, wind, in ways that we couldn't do before. It may, in fact, reduce our reliance on petroleum uh, due technologies. But technologies by themselves won't do the trick. That's what I hope some of our, our guests will also focus on today. Um, and why we have been focusing on these areas of, of, of interest in the last few years, I mean, sustainability has become a watchword. Um, you know, energy independence has become watchwords. While we have been doing this, we've been, you know, those of us who watch this have watched this. The federal government in particular has been sort of stymied on a lot of its actions. Uh, and indeed, will likely be stymied again for the next two years. Um, while that's been happening, the states and the cities have been the, inter the sort of laboratories of innovation. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, and so there's been a lot of action happening in the United States over the last 10, 15 years, whether on climate change or on alternative energy. Uh, a lot of the action has been happening at the local and state levels, not the national level as much. A lot of the activity's been happening in private sector or in the nonprofit sectors. So there's a lot going on that you may not notice, and that's what we're going to focus on today. 
We have three guests who are immensely um, suited for this task. Uh, James Hunt, to my immediate left, is the Chief of Environmental Energy Services for the City of Boston. In this capacity, he is the Mayor's Lead Advisor on Environmental and Energy Policy and oversees several city agencies, including Inspectional Services, uh, environment, the Environment Department, Parks Planning, and the Boston Recycling Program. Um, he is also serves as the mayoral appointee to the Board of Directors of the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority and a trustee of the Boston Groundwater Trust. Prior to joining the city, Jim Hunt served as Assistant Secretary for the Commonwealth's Executive Office of Environmental Affairs and was responsible for administering the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act. Uh, in this latter role, he put him in the charge of major project reviews for the state, including downtown waterfront development, MBTA transit projects, and energy projects such as Cape Wind. So it's quite a, a rather a broad uh, portfolio of experience. He is an attorney and received his JD at Suffolk University Law School and his bachelor's degree from UMass, UMass Amherst, and he is a resident of Dorchester. Uh, my colleague, Joan Fitzgerald, is Professor of Public Policy and Director of the Law Policy Society Program here at Northeastern University. She has served previously as Associate Director of what is now the Lukaku Center for Urban Regional Policy, and her areas of research and teaching include urban economic development, urban sustainability, workforce development, and green economic development. She is widely published in those areas, and, and, and most recently of her new book, Emerald Cities, Urban Sustainability and Economic Development which I can tell you is a quite nice read, and you know, it's a ripping one. <laughs> no, actually, it's, actually it's, it's very nice, and you should take a look at it. It's available on Amazon, anybody wants to buy it. Uh, she has a BA and MA in sociology from Penn State University, where she also earned her PhD in community systems, <coughs> planning, and development. Previously, jo Joan taught at Urban Policy and Social Affairs at the New School University in New York, the University of Illinois Chicago, where she spent, I think, a dozen years, or more than that, so on that and Ohio State University. And among her many other activities, she has most recently been a Fulbright Scholar, a uh, Fulbright Senior Specialist in Europe, developing a research and teaching agenda on competitive cities and climate change. Finally, Craig Altimos, uh, to our, my photos left, uh, graduated recently with a Master's in Public Policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and a JD from Harvard Law School uh, just this past May, so it's a twofer. Uh, during his studies, and this is the part that makes anybody who's been in college sort of, you know, grown, uh, during his studies, Craig founded and led Students for a Just and Sustainable Future, uh, a, 20, a network of college campuses, over 20 of them across Massachusetts, that aggregate student power to work together to promote climate, <coughs> climate stability. At Harvard, he was appointed by President Drew Faust to serve on the university's Greenhouse Gas Emissions Task Force, which recommended a university-wide goal of reducing emissions 30% by 2016. In December of 2009, he was appointed by the Massachusetts Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs, Ian Bowles, to serve as the only student on Massachusetts Green Economy and Climate Protection Advisory Committee. <coughs> After graduating, he was awarded a Kauffman Public Service Fellowship to work with his organization, now a New England-wide uh, entity. He currently serves also uh, on the Executive Committee of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Sierra Club, and on the board of directors of the Massachusetts Climate Action Network. So we have a wonderful group tonight. I've asked, they, they will appear in the order in which I've introduced them. Uh, as per usual, I'll ask each of our, our guests to talk for 15 minutes. We'll go to 7 o'clock, and at which time we'll take a break before we come back for Q&A. So thanks a lot. And I would, uh, Jim Hunt.